Coming up today on Locked On Texas Tech, conference realignment, smoke, mirrors, and media deals. Also, Pac-12 media day takeaways. And will the best quarterback Texas Tech faces this season be the first quarterback they face at Jones Stadium? We'll get to that and more next on Locked On Texas Tech. You are Locked On Texas Tech, your daily podcast on the Texas Tech Red Raiders. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We're going to start this thing off right. Everything runs through Lubbock. Great to be with you again on Locked On Texas Tech on the Locked On Podcast Network. Always appreciate being your first listen on YouTube or anywhere you get podcasts. He's the only Chris Level. I'm Casey Cowan. Chris, great to be back with you, man. And on a different note today, we begin the show, a topic that we haven't discussed in, I don't know, a few days, a few weeks, a few hours, it feels like sometime. And uh, I guess when you're thinking, well, the way that this realignment kind of conversation has evolved in large part having to do with obviously the Pac-12's pursuit of a media deal, we did kind of mark Pac-12 media days as some point on the timeline that should be pretty interesting. It has now come and gone, so we want to come and Uh, Join you here today and get into some of what we heard or maybe didn't hear uh, from those participating in Pac-12 Media Days. Also want to get to a conversation that Chris got to have with some pundits on the left coast as it relates to a Texas Tech and Oregon preview. And maybe, just maybe, that game featuring the best opposing quarterback that Tech will see this year. We'll get to that coming up in just a moment. But Chris, I know you, like I, and a whole lot of other interested parties were uh, tuned in to the Smoke and mirrors of Pac-12 media days uh, not too long ago. Wondering if there was anything to glean. And I think there might have been, but I'm curious as to what stood out to you. As obviously it happens without uh, any media deal announcement. But no worries. That was the plan all along, right? <laughs> yeah, and it's uh, it's it's Pac-12 media day in Vegas, um, and it and it's you, you know I think so many people were trying to figure out okay, are we getting a media deal? What's the you know they're going to be asked about it? What's going to be said? And then there was no Coach Prime. You know that that's what uh, I think people were probably most interested in, and it's obviously the last year that uh, that USC and UCLA will be participating in the in the league, and so. I'm sure there was some some chatter about that, like there was in uh, in Arlington about Texas and Oklahoma. The the thing about um, you know so far on Big Twelve media, I mean, excuse me, Pac twelve media deal and and realignment, and all that. It's been a, a big nothing burger to to this point. I think we continue to wait. George Klyavkov basically said, "I'm not here to talk about that. I don't want to take the focus away from from football." <laughs> he also kind of said, you know, hey, you worried about losing any of your schools to the Big 12? Nah, not worried at, at, at all. Not not even in the slightest. And um, I, I don't know. Came off as either – you could either say he's like the cat that, that you know, that ate the canary and he's like kind of got a big secret. <laughs> or he just comes off as a buffoon. I don't know which one it is. Uh, I guess we'll find out soon enough. But he had he had some confidence, whether fake or not, about their their standing in the media rights game. And I I just I'm I'm going to call his bluff on that because I just think if they were in such good shape and as he kind of wants to claim, and we've had new people come to the table, and the longer we wait, the better off it gets for us. I just I don't I don't buy it uh, because there's not one person in the industry that kind of feels like they're in a position of strength or that they know where the the carriage or the money is coming from necessarily. Not that they can't get some sort of agreement put together, but, um, but the biggest thing, Cowan, to me, and most telling, look, Coach Prime wasn't there. There was some surgery scheduled. I don't know whether that was by the, you know, I don't want to, cast dispersions or anything but I don't know whether that was by design or not I don't know if it wasn't ever labeled as emergency and maybe you could have you know rescheduled or done some different things or maybe Colorado didn't want him there and the reason I say that is because their athletic director Rick George was there and then made quite the hasty exit (laughs) 
I mean, I'm sorry. I mean, literally running. I've got a plane to catch, a private plane, mind you, that will not take off unless you're on it. It's Leave without right you. there on that runway. Yeah. Um, but bizarre behavior from Colorado, uh, I think. And I think it's, I don't know. I think it's very fair to kind of, you know, raise an eyebrow and, and kind of, hmm, interesting. Because they are heavily rumored. Yep. Uh, to be involved with this, these realignment shenanigans more so than anybody else for a long uh, time now. And and I I gather too. I will say this too, Kevin. I gather that I'm not certain that the Pac-12 is necessarily worried about it right now. I don't know if if if, if Colorado leaving if they feel like it just dampers their situation or if it feels like that, you know, if they if they would be worried that somebody else would, would jump as well. I don't know, but oh, they'll be high five and saying, Hey, at least we didn't lose USC again. Yeah. It's just Colorado. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you're heading in the right direction. Yeah. I don't, I mean, anybody that's coming to the table with those media deal agreements or negotiations and, you know, then that ends with the CW walking away from the table thinking we've got all the leverage. Well, that couldn't have gone very well for uh, any conference, I would guess, if you're in that position. And I think George Kalishnikov, uh, you know, did what he had to do, which is basically nothing. The we're not announcing a media rights deal because we want to focus on football line was hilarious, absurd and ridiculous. I thought he probably could have done better to uh, just avoid uh, saying something like that, because we all know that's not true. And then, of course, he was subsequently asked, well, does that. Are, are you insinuating that there is a media deal agreed to? I was asked about that, of course, because that is uh, the inference there. And uh, he says, I think you're reading too much into that. So, you know, I'd give him about a C plus, I guess, for his uh, whirling dervish act, so to speak, that he had to perform up there. Because for the most part, I think there weren't really sound bites that were all that damaging or laughable. But that one line was was certainly there. Uh, and noticeable, I think, by anybody that was paying attention. I'm curious about, you know, there's like this, it, it seems like the Colorado smoke obviously has been consistent, but I'm wondering if you're noticing this week and last week something that I'm noticing, which is that it seems like UConn smoke will not go away as it relates to the Big 12 Conference. And I don't know if there's been anything concrete or tangible to like see or hold on to uh, that's advanced that conversation. I'm not saying that here today. But, you know, you and I, unfortunately, are kind of accustomed to this by this point in time, you know, keeping an ear to the ground on candidates to join a league. And you've been through this round a few times with the Big 12 Conference. Sometimes you've done something. Sometimes you've done nothing. Um, but, you know, some will kind of it's kind of like the water gun race at the fair. Like eventually they're all <laughs> off to a great start. But then some just fall completely off of the map. And you're like, we never heard about Tulane again. You get the idea. Some fade into the mist, right? When they're not truly, seriously a candidate. I've seen the opposite with UConn. Chris, is, is there anything even new to mention from your perspective? Or um, do you think it just remains kind of status quo? Are we getting any any closer to a Husky addition? Because it just won't go away. First, today's episode brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. And in this day and age, every new hire can feel like a huge gamble. And when we're talking about your business or livelihood, that's not ideal. But LinkedIn Jobs is here to help by helping you find the best qualified candidates available fast and for free, all on one easy to use and secure platform. Simple but specific targeting tools allow you to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to consider. They go beyond just resume data by using insights from your job post, company, and their 875 million member profiles to put your post in front of the most qualified candidates faster than anyone else. So go to LinkedInJobs.com slash LockedOnCollege. That's LinkedInJobs.com slash LockedOnCollege today to identify the most qualified candidates and connect with them fast and for free. Just like a bad hire could sink your ship, the right hire could take your business to new heights this year. And it's no coincidence that small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors so post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college it's so easy even a podcast host could do it that's linkedin.com slash locked on college 
to post your job for free today with LinkedIn Jobs. Terms and conditions apply. Is there anything even new to mention from your perspective, or um, do you think it just remains kind of status quo? Are we getting any any closer to a Husky edition? Because it just won't go away. I saw a lot of the chatter, like you did. Uh, I think that it was started, uh, this latest round was started over the weekend by a TV reporter in Orlando, I think I'm right. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah, and, and, and I think um, it, it's turned out to be, you know, n- nothing to this point. But I, I do think, I do think there is uh, more UConn chatter than there is, like say Gonzaga. I think there's more UConn chatter than there is really anybody else other than Colorado. Uh, I think, you know, and I, I'll be honest with you, um, I, I think I would be semi excited about a Colorado edition or just like, this is good. I think, you know, this is a no brainer edition. They're, they're a current power five member and all that stuff. I can't decide if I would be feel that way about UConn. Um, and if I'm rooting for that or not, um, I will tell you though, that the reason, and we know the reason that, you know, one market. Okay. And, and it, and it's, it makes some sense with the, with the Cincinnati's and the, and the West Virginia's it's, it's another, East Coast school, potentially, you know, obviously Central Florida and all that. So it, it kind of, you know, broadens your scope as far as the the, the national scale with which Brett Yormark has talked about how he wants to do. But I saw this, uh, I guess it was yesterday. Somebody went and done the research. Maybe it was John Rothstein. I can't remember. But the college basketball deal, which is why UConn is even being discussed. Let's be honest. Five national championships. They, they are – a, a not I don't know if they're a blue blood, but maybe they're a new blood, whatever. But they win and they win big and they've got titles to prove it. But last year in the Big 12, every Big 12 team played on average of 21 quad one games. 21. Everybody's playing in the in the 30 to 35, you know, 38 game range, but 21 easily the most of any league in the country. And so the Big Ten and the SEC, I think they were next, and they were playing on average of 14 a year. So this is what Brett Yormark is seeing is basketball brand. You know, you, you add UConn and you could say, well, now look how many of the national championships that the Big 12 has won if you add UConn. You know, we know what Kansas has done. You know, Baylor got them won. Um, you know, and then and you you talk about uh, you know all all the ones that you kind of five since ninety nine, and you just start you know because this is what this is the card the SEC plays. So I don't know if you're on the cusp of adding them, but you're right. There's a lot of smoke. Uh, it seems to be you know out there for a reason. Uh, I think it's been written about by reputable reporters as well. It's like, hey man, I think the Big Twelve is actually more keen on on UConn than anybody else of, as far as the group of vi- group of five members. And so I don't know, I, you know, we're all going to get lulled to sleep here when training camp starts in, in about a week or so, and we're going to forget about this. And then someday, you know, you're going to get a media rights deal or you're going to get a realignment move and you're going to go, Whoa, didn't see that coming. But right now, yeah, I'm paying attention to the way the smoke is blowing and it's hard to, hard to, <laughs> hard to figure out right now. It's all around you. It's swirling uh, west to east, up, down, yeah. uh, just about anywhere you look. And uh, yeah, the excitement for those that we uh, mentioned in particular for me, I'm, I'm somewhat sharing the, the feelings that you've expressed there, but I think I'm mostly just excited for a resolution if we could ever possibly find one <laughs> and kind of get to the end of this path. Did you see the, um, the numbers that were put out? Somebody was comparing... Uh, this is back to Colorado, but somebody was comparing what they would have made in the Big 12 Conference and what they did make since their uh, exit to the Pac-12. And they lost around $67 million uh, just yep. being in the Pac-12 in the time that they have versus what those in the Big 12 uh, were, were taking home. That that blew me away. And I don't know that I expected the Gulf to be that big. I thought there would be a discrepancy, but... Um, you just kind of sit here and you wonder what might have been, obviously, if some things shake out differently uh, a couple of different times over the previous decade. There is some some geographic sense uh, with Colorado and the Pac-12, I guess. But I also think there's a lot of like big eight 
since with Colorado and, sure. and the Big 12. You know, um, I don't know who Colorado's like natural rival is in the in the in the Pac-12. I, I think that uh, you know that they they miss. Obviously, they've asked their head coach uh, about getting in back into the state of Texas. That is his preference. I think Rick Jordan certainly didn't want to comment on it uh, on the record about any anything. I think that's fairly telling. I think that their school president indicated uh, publicly, what was it, a week ago? Hey, yeah, the the, the, the board of directors or, or, or Kaliavkov is supposed to present us with something by the end of this week. And apparently he knew all too well that that wasn't really the case, but he was trying to put pressure. That's what people have theorized is yeah. that he was trying to put pressure on the leadership there. And then you, you hear Kaliavkov talk about, I'm on the board of directors. I know who's who's what everybody's opinion is. So I, I think that you know the Pac-12 knows about Colorado's frustration and, and angst and possibility to split, and I think uh, vice versa. And so you know I don't know I don't know what we get, and if they'll ever. I, I would say it's going to be a bit difficult to put the toothpaste back in the tube for Colorado and be like all hunky dory with the Pac-12 at some level. You mean like San Diego State? <laughs> Yeah, and, and maybe I don't – I'm not, you know, as familiar as I need to be before I make a statement like that, but I just think that, you know, there's been some jabbing back and forth and some right. playful banter, and I just wonder, oh, like, okay, guys, we were just kidding. We we really <laughs> like being a member of this deal. Uh, you know, we, we appreciate, uh, you know, everything you've done for us. We, we want to shake hands and let's, let's – Quit? What yeah. quit? No quit. <laughs> yeah, you'll I, always be a loser. I'm a winner, and you know, you know what I'm gonna do? Uh, I'm gonna slip him a Mickey. <laughs> Such a great episode, man! Such a great episode. Yes. Kalishnikov. Also, yeah. uh, Pac-12 decision makers. Uh, don't sleep on the Locked On Podcast Network. Possibly as a landing spot for your broadcast rights. We'd be happy uh, to throw in a game here between Locked On Texas Tech episodes. If you need a hand up. Okay. Well, Pac-12 media days did come and go. There were some interesting things, but for the most part, I think they were able to sidestep any big media flare ups. But as we're talking about that smoke persists, certainly from Boulder and stores, at Connecticut will be interesting to see where maybe some other uh, brush fires break out. And we have some more smoke uh, to observe as we roll through this upcoming football season and that's what we want to get to next we will actually stay on the left coast i want to get to a conversation that uh chris level had in uh what with a portland oregon outlet i believe right chris yes uh, yeah, radio portland, conversation oregon. absolutely um to preview texas tech in oregon and got us to thinking about what exactly is going to be there in a duck uniform whenever they come to town and it could include possibly the best opposing quarterback Texas Tech will see this season. We'll get to that and more coming up next on Locked On Texas Tech. On Locked On Texas Tech on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day right here on YouTube or anywhere you get podcasts. Subscribe on YouTube if you haven't so far so you never miss an episode Fall camp just over the horizon, Chris, and we'll be getting into that hot and heavy on the other side of this upcoming weekend, of course, as we look ahead to an opener from Wyoming, but then a home opener unlike any other in recent memory and maybe even longer than that, Chris. I was just thinking about uh, yesterday, how it's going to feel walking up to the Jones. Uh, it'll probably be warm, and you're thinking, all right, first time we get a look at the Red Raiders, so... Tom, Dick, and Harry probably on the other sideline. Hell, I might be out of here by mid-third quarter back at the tailgate. And then you're going to remember it's the Oregon Ducks that have come to town to open up your home schedule. And I just hope the football team themselves are not forgetting about this kind of thing. This ain't no warm-up. There is not a warm-up, I don't believe, uh, in 2023 because the season opener on the road could be tricky as any season opener anywhere uh, can be for any team. But Man, it gets real in week two uh, as you come back to the LBK. And I know you were visiting with uh, some Portlandites. I'm not sure what the word is. Uh, recently to preview that matchup. And I'm curious what you were hearing from them, uh, possibly as they anticipate Texas Tech. I, I, th I think the Oregon fan is, is used to winning. I think the Oregon fan is a bit... Um... 
tortured, if that makes sense, because I think Oregon has been really good for many, many years. And I think they're bored with like eight and nine win seasons. Like it's got to be, you know, I mean, it's like, okay, if we didn't go to the Rose Bowl and win it at least, I mean, I, I can't really get excited about that. It's it's a tough place to be as a, as a fan. It's like, okay, we're really good, but we're not like the best. And we haven't been the best. And USC has is, is been, is been good. And so one of the conversations they had I thought was interesting is that they, they basically said, man, it just seems like from afar that the tech fan is very level-headed. And I'm like, most um, are. I think, you know, anytime you're talking about any kind of fan base, there's, you know, it can kind of go all over the road there. But he, you know, they, they both the hosts were saying, you know, it just seems like they would be really pleased with an eight or nine one season. And I'm like, that's true because you, you kind of were used to that. And then it stopped happening. And so you'd like to kind of get back to there before you can get bored with it. Kind of like the Oregon fan is <laughs> right. uh, now, you know, uh, and, uh, but one of the things that he commented on, uh, one of the main guys that, that commented on was, hey, h- how is the Red Raiders defense? Because Bo Nix was really, really good last year, and they are loaded at receiver, are the Ducks. I mean, how how will Tim DeRuiter's defense be and, and all that? And obviously they know, you know, it's not just – the Tyler Shuck game. I mean, Tim DeRuiter was the DC up there, you know, so they, they know coach DeRuiter uh, at Oregon as well. He spent some time up there and, and, and did a really good job. And then we know about the draft pick of Kayvon Thibodeau and all that stuff. But I, I think, uh, and, and then later this, that, that morning I get a, an email from one of the, 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 I'm on some email list from Vegas odds that they, they do with sports and stuff. And it, it was a college football Vegas odds email. And one of the topics was, over under on QBs uh, as far as passing yards and touchdowns. And one of the top guys on both lists was Bo Nix, who is, you know, set to, to, to quarterback the Ducks this year. And, you know, they they set the over under on 3,100 passing yards and I think 26 and a half passing touchdowns. And I looked at the rest of this list and I tried, you know, Caleb Williams is obviously on there. Quinn Ewers was the only other Big 12 quarterback I could find. His numbers weren't quite as high. He may have had more passing yards, but not quite as much of, a, of an over-under on the passing touchdown total to bet on. Bottom line, though, is, is that I just wonder if the general fan, yeah, you think Oregon, you know Oregon, you think flashy uniform, you probably don't know who coaches him. Dan Lanning is his name. Uh, but you, you may not, you know, be super familiar with Bo Nix. And he spent a lot of time in the SEC, but he's been on, on the West Coast for a bit now. And he's a plus quarterback. I mean, he's a he's a really good one and a potential pro guy. Yeah, uh, year number five for Bo Nix. I mean, he seems like uh, he's old enough to be a college football grandfather by this point in time. So uh, there's going to be some old guys on the field uh, yep. for that one, Chris. But, yeah, it's really – I, I don't know of a kickoff to a season that's been more intriguing again in quite some time, partially because you have some expectation of being uh, hopefully a more than competitive football team, Chris. So that always brings a different feeling with it, of course. But uh, and certainly given recent history, it's a different feeling. But, you know, just also the fact that you do have the setup uh, for these first two games. I, I can't wait to get there and find out what you are. Of course, you're um, champing at the bit, champing or chomping at the bit. Um, every season, <laughs> I don't want to go to Costanza on you here today and just get totally off the tracks, but I can't help it. I have an addiction. Um, I just on the road, Wyoming can be prickly. We've talked about that before. We'll talk about it again as we get closer to that, but then real live fire immediately when you get back to Lubbock and you open up that home schedule. Uh, and I just hope that those guys are ready uh, for that kind of game because it's not the typical setting that you get, right? I mean, I don't know if the team really falls into that kind of lull, but I know I, as a fan, you just think, all right, well, first home game will be a complete snooze fest, you know, with <laughs> some Joe Blow from the FCS level or whatever it might be. This will be the complete opposite of that and could set you up uh, for some very compelling weeks to follow or could entirely pop your balloon, right? And that's assuming you get a win, uh, of course, in week one, but Kind of curious that from an individual standpoint, you may see the best you'll see as far as that position is concerned uh, for the remainder of the year. 
there the first time out. I I mean, Ewers, I guess, has to be on the list because he's got a certain logo on his helmet. But I don't really even know who would be close. I, I think I'd have to agree with kind of that sentiment that, that Bo Nix is that guy. Yeah, I mean, v- Vegas certainly, uh, you know, I mean, I, you know, we know Jalen Daniels, Offensive Player of the Year. He's going to be a handful if he's healthy whenever you see him sure. just because of what he can do with his legs. I think, you know, like guys like Chandler Morris is a bit of an unknown at TCU. I think Will Howard uh, obviously, you know, won a Big 12 championship last year, so he, he certainly deserves some respect. Uh, I think um, – I'm trying to think. Well, Dylan Gabriel, uh, you know, you're not going to see. You're not going to see Alan Bowman. Um, you know, I, I think Donovan Smith you may see, obviously, at, at University of Houston. But, yeah, I mean, I think Bo Nix on paper, you know, that, and that's kind of what – Vegas looks at they're looking at they're trying to project and 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 all those things but yeah I was trying to the the Oregon game because I think they asked me that question too most highly anticipated non-conference game since and I was just trying to think of early season game you know there there was the 0203 stretch I think it was when Philip Rivers and Eli Manning came in and you had no idea that Philip Rivers was going to go on to father 10 children and be an NFL <laughs> Hall, of, Hall of Famer. Um, no, I did anticipate the children part. I didn't see the career yeah. coming, but and he, the, the and name I took away from that game was T.A. McClendon. Yeah, he was. I'm not mistaken. Salty. Yeah. And Philip Rivers has actually worn some tech gear at, at different That's times right. uh, <laughs> in his career and like a, and, and with the bolo tie and everything. But, but, You'd have to go back to the 90s. You know, Nebraska would come in here when they weren't a member of the Big 12. It's like number one in the country. Miami and Warren Sapp did on a – I think that was a Thursday night, if memory serves, back in the early 90s. So, I really don't know. Damn, um, you had to go back 20 years. To, I was afraid of that, that NC State and Ole Miss are going to be the memory. And I thought, no, Chris will come up with something between then and now that I missed. Well – And maybe we are, but I, I don't remember anything between then and now. It, it's just the, the the power five home and homes have been rare. Uh, I think that typically, you know, because you've played, you played Ole Miss and Houston to open up a season as part yeah. of a non-conference deal. You played University of Houston and, and the city of Houston as a non-conference deal. There's a lot of regional games and, and then you've played some power five teams, but some of that has been some neutral site stuff, but the yeah. home and home is a bit different and, you know, maybe I'm forgetting an obvious, but that's kind of what I went back to high profile wise. And it's been a while, but this one is different. You're right. This one is absolutely different. I hate it that your stadium won't be, you know, totally done. And it's going to be a bit of a, you know, a, an issue, I think, for fans and everybody involved. But that's just the way it's going to be. Uh, but yeah, that one is uh, that one. There's going to be a lot of stress in Lubbock, Texas, that day for all kinds of reasons, uh, and hopefully it, it ends with uh, some fun because that one that one is very meaningful. Yes. Yeah, and hopefully you're hitting it with a one and zero record already because you took care of business on the road uh, to open up the season. And yeah, it'll be a construction site there still in the south end zone. And man, you thought those snare drums were loud on fourth down. Wait till we get our third down. Wait till we get to the jackhammers going. You know, that's really going <laughs> to, I think that's going to be an environment advantage uh, for Texas Tech. Wait and see. All right, Chris, enjoy the time as always, my man. Appreciate the insights and perspectives. Hopefully you're not picking up any bad habits from talking to the people in Portland there. Your hair is not pink or teal as far as I can tell, although maybe a new piercing, but it could be just some pixelation. So I'll confirm that off the air. <laughs> Chris, enjoy it as always, man. We'll do it again tomorrow. Hey, man, appreciate it. Uh, We will do it. And uh, getting closer, folks, getting closer. Still got a ways to go, but getting a little bit closer. But keep hope alive. Hope everybody has a good uh, Wednesday, hump day, all that business. We'll be back with you tomorrow. That's right. Subscribe on YouTube so you never miss an episode or wherever you got this podcast. And we'll see you for the next round on Locked on Texas Tech.